In this lesson, we're going to look at Hitler's foreign policies from the Rhineland, the occupation by the Rhineland of German troops, and the Anschluss, the Union of Austria and Germany. As you watch the video, you should make notes on the following things. Is there any evidence that Hitler was a gambler, that he took risks which could have gone wrong, or if they went well, he'd gain rewards from? Is there evidence that he didn't believe that France or Britain would risk a war to stop him doing what he wanted? What evidence can you find that Hitler wasn't a respecter of national votes, a respecter of democracy? On occasion, is there evidence that he sometimes acted like a madman? And was he good at propaganda? Was he good at public spin, at giving out a message into an international audience? Okay, so let's move on. The Rhineland in March of 1936. German troops march into the Rhineland. Now, if you remember, the Rhineland was German territory. It was part of Germany, but Germany had been forbidden to station troops there by the Treaty of Versailles. So Hitler's breaking the Treaty of Versailles. This is, however, a very risky move for Hitler. What if there were, was French resistance? What if the French tried to stop the occupation of the Rhineland with armed forces? If the, if the French generals decided to go to war? At that stage, Hitler had started rearmament in Germany, but the army was not actually ready yet for a large-scale conflict. The French outnumbered the Germans and would have been able to drive the Germans out of the Rhineland relatively easily. German generals, many of them, actually opposed Hitler's idea of stationing troops in the Rhineland. They, they didn't like the idea, but Hitler ignored them and he went ahead with it anyway. Even in the first few days of the occupation of the Rhineland, many German generals asked Hitler to pull the troops out. He ignored that and the, the, the invasion was successful. They did have orders, however, to retreat if they did meet any resistance by the French. They didn't, and so the occupation was complete. So German troops occupied the Rhineland in March of 1936. Next, Hitler projected a public image of being a peacemaker, a bit of a politician. He talked about new plans for a long-term peace in Europe. Um, he proposed a new 25-year agreement between Germany, France and Belgium, sort of non-aggression pact. He's looking very much like a peacemaker here. He talks about Germany rejoining the League of Nations. It's doubtful he ever had that intention. He never did. But he talks about rejoining the League of Nations. He talks about demilitarised zones on the German borders with France on both the German and the French side. The French aren't probably going to take him up on this offer because they've got their Maginot line there. But he does appear to be talking about peace. And this British politician, Arthur Henderson, you know, talked about an olive branch is a symbol of peace. He says, look, we need to believe Hitler. We ought to take him at face value. Anxious to preserve the peace. Later on, this uh, gentleman, Francois Ponce, he was the French ambassador to Germany in Berlin. And this is a comment he made after the war in 1949. Hitler smacked his enemy in the face, and as he did so, he declared, I bring you proposals of peace. Uh, Francois Ponce is pointing out that Hitler's actions and his words are very different. His actions are aggressive and militaristic, but at the same time, he's talking about peace. So it's very, very contradictory. Sorry about that, I just had to put that in. <laughs> so, how did the French and the British react to the German occupation of the Rhineland? Well, the French protested, uh, but they didn't fight, they didn't send any armed troops. They were sitting behind the Maginot Line. If you remember, the French spent a lot of money building a defensive line called the Maginot Line. The British felt that, after all, this was German territory. He wasn't marching into an area that wasn't in Germany. One politician said, well, you know, I don't give two hoots about the Rhineland. They didn't see it as an important thing. Certainly not important enough to go to war over. What did Hitler say about this later on? This is some, some comments that he made later in his life. So Hitler said, the 48 hours after the march into the Rhineland were the most nerve-wracking of my life. If the French had then marched into the Rhineland, we would have had to withdraw with our tails between our legs for the military resources at our disposal would have been wholly inadequate for even a moderate resistance. 
Uh, next comment really shows you that um, modesty is not one of Hitler's personality traits. What would have happened in March of 1936 if anyone else had been in charge of Germany? Anyone else would have lost his nerve. I had to lie. We were saved by my unshakable obstinacy and my remarkable daring. Obstinacy means stubbornness. You're not going to be moved. So Hitler's kind of boasting here. Uh, he's admitting that he lied, uh, but he's admitting that there's an element of risk there. He's talking about daring, so that daring implies that there is some risk there, but he's obviously praising himself somewhat there as well. Next, in 1938, the Anschluss takes place. In 1938, in Austria, there are some Austrian Nazis who believe, support, they want Austria to be united with Nazi Germany. They cause a problem for the leader of Austria, who was called Schusnig. Um, they cause problems, in fact, <laughs> they acted even without consulting the Nazi bosses in Germany itself, they actually had a plot to kill the German ambassador. So the Austrian Nazis had a plan to kill the German ambassador, which seems a bit strange when you think the German ambassador would have actually been a Nazi. Uh, but the, pl the plan was that they would kill the German ambassador and this would prompt a German takeover of Austria, which is what the Austrian Nazis wanted. Well, in February of 1938, Schusnig met Hitler to discuss this problem. Now, Hitler screamed and shouted, ranted and raved at Schusnig for two whole hours. He said things like the Nazis should have more control in Austria, they should control the police. These are the sorts of things which it would effectively give Nazi Germany complete control over Austria. He threatened Schusnig by saying, no other state will raise its voice if Germany settles its border problems, an implicit threat that he could invade. You don't seriously think you can stop me. So he's kind of shouting, screaming at Schusnig. Schusnig doesn't have a lot of options at this point, so he, on the surface, he agrees. What does Schusnig do next? He doesn't really want a Nazi German takeover of Austria. So he organises a national vote or plebiscite. A plebiscite asking the question, do we want to remain an independent Austria or do we want to become part of Nazi Germany? He does set the voting age quite high at 24. He knows that many of the Austrian Nazis are young, so he wants to exclude them from that process. Now, Hitler does not want to risk the vote going against him. There's a chance that the Austrians could vote to remain independent from Nazi Germany. And on the 11th of March, the German army invaded Austria. There wasn't any resistance from the armed forces of Austria, but certainly not all Austrians supported the Nazi takeover. There were some cheering crowds, there was some support, but there were people who were against the Nazi takeover. And in Vienna, 76,000 potential enemies of the Nazi regime were arrested, a huge amount, and sent to concentration camps. On the 12th of March, Hitler visited. Now then, Schusnig makes this speech. Men and women of Austria, today we have been faced with a difficult situation. The German government gave us an ultimatum. Appoint a chancellor, a candidate nominated by Germany, otherwise German troops will march into Austria. There is no truth in the stories that there has been unrest, that streams of blood have flowed, and that the government could not maintain order. This was propaganda put out by the Austrian Nazis and the German government, that there was terrible fighting in Austria, and that German troops had to march in to restore order. This is denied by Schusnig. He says this simply isn't happening. However, the Austrian government has decided to yield to force because we do not want to shed German blood, we have ordered our armed force to offer no resistance. So there you go, that's the Anschluss, the German takeover of Austria, and the occupation of the Rhineland by German troops. So I hope that you've managed to notice some evidence on some of these points. Was Hitler a gambler? Did you find evidence for that? Is there evidence that Hitler believed that Britain and France would not go to war to stop him? What did you find in terms of Hitler not respecting a democratic vote? Did he sometimes act like a lunatic, like a madman? 
Okay.